A pleasant evening to everyone. On behalf of St. Joseph's College of Engineering, Department of Biotechnology, it gives me an immense pleasure to welcome one and all gathered here to attend this Biotalk series for 2.11. I extend my warm welcome to our honorable resource person, Dr. Santosh Kalash, who joined us today to be a part of this program to speak on the topic nanomaterial-based photothermal cancer therapy. I bid a warm welcome to our beloved attorneys, Dr. G. Sri Kumar, sir, and Dr. V. V. Renuka, ma'am, and all the other faculty members. I also extend my hearty welcome to the students of both UG and PG program. We are honored to have you all with us. Now, I request our uh, HOD, Dr. G. Sri Kumar, sir, to inaugurate this event. Uh, good evening to my dear students and staff members. I'm happy to see you all again in this BioTalk lecture series version 2.11. For the sake of uh, invited speaker, I wish to highlight some of the credits about our college and the department. St. Joseph College of Engineering is one of the top colleges in India with the 160th position as well as the NIR of ranking is concerned. It has got 27 years of high reputation in educational society possessing NBA and NAC A plus grade accreditations. There are 12 UG programs and 7 PG programs with an affiliation from Anna University Chennai. Recently, we have received autonomous status uh, which will be implemented uh, from this academic year. Our Department of Biotechnology was inserted in the year 2002 and having VTech and MTech Biotechnology programs. Since inception, we have backed 139 university ranks with uh, 10 golds and 7 silver medals and maintain around 100% pass percentage every year. The department has got sophisticated laboratory facilities and fetched the research center recognition from Anna University to do PhD program. We have more than 1.2 crores of rupees as government funding for conducting research. The effect of current COVID pandemic and subsequent lockdown is worst for the mental health and happiness of the students and teachers community. Unlike other professions, the enormous potential that they were using in daily life is now blocked. In this crisis, it is imperative to design effective mode of communications for the smooth running of learning and for innovative researching. Understanding this need of the hour, our biotech department keeps our students educated towards ongoing research and development occurring around the world through conducting BioTalk lecture series by bringing eminent personalities through webinar and sharing their research views to the entire biotech community that includes students, teachers and research professionals. These programs were very much successful with positive feedback from participants. In this way, today we are delighted to have Dr. Santosh Kalash, postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Biomedical Engineering, Tufts University, Medford, USA, as a resource person. Today's lecture is going to be in the topic of nanomaterial-based photothermal cancer therapy, which will be uh, a rare research and life-saving approach. And I'm sure it is going to be a gateway to our students who have more research avenues in this area. On behalf of the patrons, Dr. Babu Manohan, Chairman, Ms. Jessipriya, Managing Director, and Mr. Sasi Shegar, Director, and Dr. V.S. Rao, Principal, and uh, Parvada Vardhani, uh, uh, Dean, I welcome the speaker, Dr. Santosh Alash, and the Biotech staff members, and all the Biotech students to this uh, Biotech lecture series. I also can give my warm felicitation to Dr. Chamundi Shri, Associate Professor, for organizing this webinar. Now I ask the student coordinator, Mr. Alfred Francis, to give a brief introduction about the invited speaker. All the best to you all. Thank you. Over to Mr. Alfred. Thank you, sir. Dr. Santosh Kalaj has completed his bachelor's in biotechnology from Anna University, Tamil Nadu, and his master's in molecular medicine from Amrita Vaishwa, Vidyapitam University, Tamil Nadu. He has also completed his PhD on Biomedical Sciences from Chonam National University, South Korea. Dr. Santosh started his career as a researcher in Chonam University, 
and then work as a research affiliate in the Department of Renal Division in Harvard Medical School, Boston. Later, he joined as a postdoctoral associate researcher in Birmingham University and a women's hospital, Boston. Currently, he is working as a postdoctoral research associate in Tufts University, United States. Dr. Santosh has also got patents such as on macrophage targeting nano assembly and anti inflammatory composition containing, and also an another patent on tumor microenvironment response to nano complex and anti cancer composition comprising same. Dr. Santosh has done Many publications such as Hyron Prussian blue nanoparticle as nano stress reliever through tempering tissue resident macrophages from LPS induced endotoxemia murin model, and another publication on trigger response gene transporters for anti cancer therapy, and also many more publications. It is an immense pleasure in welcoming you, sir, and I request you to take over the session from you. Okay, um, thank you so much uh, for the uh, great introduction. Um, so, uh, is it fine? So, can I start uh, by sharing the screen? Uh, yes, sir, sure. Yeah. So, you can also turn on your camera. So. Oh, sorry, yeah. Thank you, sir. So just let me know if you can see the whole screen. Yes, sir, we can see your screen, sir. Yeah, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. A great uh, good evening for all. Um, so my name is Santosh Klaas. So I'm a postdoc at uh, Tufts University. So, for the past seven years, uh, I've been working on uh, on uh, nanobacterial-based uh, photothermal therapy, uh, basically for uh, for cancer therapy. Uh, so today, I'm going to explain uh, my uh, uh, research uh, on 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 this uh, particular topic uh, in more detail, uh, and also I'm going to let you know like what are the different types of challenges I have faced during this research. Um, so the structure of this presentation will be like, I will be giving a brief introduction about nanometrial based photothermal therapy and, uh, and also two research topics. One will be focusing on um, uh, uh, photothermal therapy uh, using uh, zwitterionic polymer uh, lipid based nanoparticles uh, uh, in uh, the cervical tumor model. The second topic will be like more in depth. It will be like uh, explaining more about the anti-tumor immune response induced by this uh, photothermal therapy in uh, triple negative breast cancer. And uh, after this, I will be like giving you some, you know, career advice, like what you can do after your bachelor's or master's. Um, so I am not like an expert in this, but I can give you uh, some uh, idea or some knowledge uh, based on my experience what I had here uh, and during my PhD um so but if you are like if you have still have more questions and uh, and uh, you need to like have more clarifications you can just email me you know and you can email me and i can reply to you anytime if you want um so getting to the presentation is like so what is uh starting with nanoparticles itself so the definition of nanoparticle is that any 2d or 3d nanomaterials which is having a size of around 1 to 100 nanometers uh, basically considered as nanoparticles. Uh, but uh, uh, when I joined uh, my PhD, that is the first time I was introduced to nanoparticles. Um, uh, there were like each individual have their own definitions of nanoparticles. So which means that people like some people claim that it's 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 not uh, uh, the nanoparticle doesn't have like a defined shape. Some people say it has a defined shape. Some people say it is having a size uh, not just within the range of one to hundred, but also uh, size above five hundred is also considered as nanoparticles. So there is like a, not a defined definition 
for nanoparticles so far. So it is still a controversial topic. So for now, you can like fix to this particular definition that it's uh, nanoparticles means uh, with a size of one to 100 nanometers are considered as nanoparticles. So there are different categories of nanoparticles, basically the two. Uh, one is uh, inorganic nanoparticles and other one is organic nanoparticles. So when you come to inorganic nanoparticles, uh, basically metal-based nanoparticles, um, carbon-based nanoparticles, silica-based nanoparticles, these basically inorganic nanoparticles are used for both uh, drug delivery and also for imaging, uh, like CD imaging, MRI imaging, etc. Um, but uh, when it comes to organic nanoparticles, uh, then we are like quite familiar with the uh, micelles, liposomes, uh, many polymeric nanoparticles like TLGA. So these uh, nanoparticles are basically used for gene delivery, drug delivery, and also sometimes imaging uh, agent delivery. So there, are, these are the two different uh, categories of nanoparticles. Now, why we need nanoparticles for cancer therapy? The basic reason is that these particles are basically versatile. So you can use it for any different types of application in therapy. Uh, you can deliver any uh, types of uh, therapeutic agents. It can be hydrophobic, hydrophilic, DNA, RNA, anything. You can de easily deliver using these materials. And uh, and uh, more important is that now we are familiar with the lipid-based nanoparticles because of the COVID. You know, if you had a vaccine from Pfizer and uh, Moderna, uh, you may be knowing that, that those vaccines are like basically lipid nanoparticles, you know, complexed with uh, um, with uh, uh, mRNA encoding the, the spike protein. So, so we are familiar with uh, actually the nanoparticle nowadays. So the quite famous one is the liposomes. And uh, what nanoparticle, uh, why we are using nanoparticle for cancer is because cancer is a very complex uh, uh, disease, a very, very complex disease, a heterogeneous disease. Uh, you will have both healthy tissues and also the, the cancerous tissues in one place. So you have to like differentiate your, your material, your, your therapeutic agent have to differentiate that. So basic, the current existing uh, drugs, uh, they, they fail to define which, uh, which cells they have to target. Um, so our nanoparticles that, that we fabricate can able to like specifically target those cancer cells and, 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 uh, and deliver those drugs specifically to those cells. And uh, this nanoparticles we can engineer in any way we want. Um, for example, you can, you know, uh, um, you can have these nanoparticles uh, release the drug specifically to one particular conditions. Like you can give a stimuli. You can be, it can be the stimuli can be in an external stimuli or internal stimuli, external stimuli. Like you can give from externally the heat or light or or any kind of uh, ultrasound or magnetic alternative magnetic field. You can give to have the drug getting triggered and released to the tumor microenvironment. Um, the other case is like if you have understood the tumor microenvironment very well, you may be knowing that uh, the the there are a lot of different uh, parts uh, in the tumor that that is different from the healthy tissues or healthy organs. Uh, one is that pH, you know, basically the blood pH uh, is 7.4, but uh, when it goes to tumor, it's uh, around 6.5, uh, so which is like slightly acidic. And uh, also you see that the tumors, most of the tumors, they have a lot of uh, glutathione, which is, uh, uh, which gives you more amount of redox uh, uh, environment. And also they have huge amount of enzymes activity there, uh, basically catepsin, halonase enzyme, metalloprotease, you can name it. So these proteins, enzymes, it helps uh, these cancer cells to metastasize to different uh, organs. Um, so you can, uh, if you understand uh, the cancer biology very well, then you can develop material, um, you know, uh, responding to those uh, stimuli in, in in the tumor. So this uh, the re so overall the reason why we you, we can use uh, we need the nanomaterials is because they are like very specific. We can make it specific targeting to the cancer cells. They can do multiple tasks. They can do imaging. They can do therapy. They can do delivery. And also they can be responsive, they can be made into smart uh, nanomaterials. 
and uh, why we need them for cancer, uh, uh, especially for different cancer therapies, is because um, there are like different types of uh, therapies. Basically, there's systemic and there's an external. So systemic. Uh, so when we when a patient comes with a with a, with a stage one cancer or prior prior with a primary tumor. Um, this they they basically getting removed by surgery. That's a that's the first line of therapy. Um, but um, the later stage, the patient have to undergo systemic therapy like chemotherapy, um, and also you know some cases they also may go for immunotherapy, which is they are using antibodies for that. Um, but uh, when it comes to external therapy, the quite, quite familiar and very famous one is the radiotherapy here, the radiation therapy. So this therapy is basically used to prevent any kind of metastasis uh, or any chances of getting the uh, metastasis to other organs. So just to, to prevent that, we use uh, radiation therapy. But nowadays, the preclinical uh, studies are uh, bringing up with different types of technologies and, and therapies uh, to, to kill cancer. And a few of them are the or the or the or the the one that I have mentioned here is that uh, the um, the HIFU uh, ultrasound uh, uh, focused ultra ultrasound therapy, and then the two ones that is uh, photothermal therapy and photodynamic therapy. So today I will be discussing mainly on photothermal therapy. Um, the, other than this, there are different types of uh, therapies also, like using uh, magnetic hyperthermia. You have also like uh, recently the, there is a company called Novacure. Uh, they are uh, using a mild electrical impulse uh, that they can it can be sent uh, using instrument to to the tumor, and therefore due to the electrical field, uh, the cells stop dividing. So this is uh, like the current technology that is going on uh, with the company. And um, so why photothermal therapy? Basically, the reason why I, I, I started to focus on photothermal therapy is because it's a very kind of a local therapy. Uh, you, you, do, you, you can work mostly on, 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 the, on the superficial uh, tumors. And uh, when I started this uh, work, um, uh, I I started uh, as an as to gain experience in 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 in, in that. That's it. With uh, just a not very great interest over this, but just it's a, as a as a collaboration or as a job, I, I did that. But when I like did more more work on this, I I got more more interesting data and more interested towards this particular type of therapy. Um, so where you can use this particular type of therapy. So. Basically, photothermal or photodynamic therapy, any, any 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 of this laser type of therapies, you can use it on superficial tumors. Uh, you can use it on solid tumors. Any tumors where which you can get easily accessible, uh, you can access the tumors uh, uh, easily. That those type of tumors you can employ this photothermal therapy. For example, you can you know for brain tumor you can use this because uh, you can like simply open the skull and you can like created with laser and nanomaterials um, so what type of so what is actually photothermal therapy photothermal therapy is nothing but using uh, a, a near infrared laser you can you just have to irradiate uh, the nanoparticles or or the materials uh, that is uh, injected in the in the tumor region and uh, due to the the property of the nanomaterials that they generate heat and uh, this heat basically you know there is a limit there's a limit for this it's called ablation temperature so they have to reach that temperature to kill the cancer cells so the temperature is more than 49 degrees celsius so this temperature uh, basically the tumor uh, uh, the proteins inside the uh, the cancer cells they basically and uh, they they de undergo degradation but they cannot do uh, go back for defaulting so this way the cancer cells are like completely uh, you know they undergo this uh, cell death process. So ablated cells basically they undergo the necrosis. Maximum they undergo necrosis. Um, some cases they go for apoptosis, um, but most of the cells uh, they undergo necrosis. And uh, why using lasers? Uh, so laser has a very interesting property actually. Uh, laser has the property to basically near near infrared lasers. Uh, they have the property to penetrate tissue 
uh, the, uh, the tissue much deeper than compared to the other different uh, types of uh, lights. Uh, and more important is that uh, neon infrared lasers, they basically, they are not getting absorbed by uh, the water or the proteins uh, or any type of minerals that is present in our tissues. So they will be only absorbed by the by the nanomaterial that we have injected. So there will be like no potential uh, toxicity uh, to the or damage to the tissues in that case. So NIR uh, lasers or like having that, that type of advantage for that. And um, so how nanomaterials basically they convert light to heat. Um, so you know that this uh, this particular I think most of you will be familiar with this diagram. It's called Jablonski diagram. Um, so when you have uh, 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 incident light uh, hitting the, the the surface of the material, the electrons in that they get uh, excited uh, towards uh, the higher energy level, and then when they come back, they emit energy, and this energy can be like in the form of fluorescence light. It can be in the form of heat. And some cases, uh, when they when these electrons like stay in the higher energy level, like higher energy state for a long time, uh, they also like transfer those electrons to the neighboring um, uh, molecules like oxygen and uh, generate uh, radicals, free radicals. So those uh, free radicals can kill also kill cancer. Um, so 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 basically, this uh, this concept. Uh, follows for every nanometers that that uh, we are using and uh, more important thing is that uh, uh, metallic nanoparticles uh, with uh, with a good localized surface plasma resonance um, behave the same um, well in this case is that uh, when these excited uh, uh, electrons uh, they, they come back there is a change in the electron density between uh, the surface of the of the nanometer, especially if you take gold, uh, there is a change in the electron density between these two, uh, between the uh, the surfaces, and due to which there is a huge vibration, uh, and due to these huge vibrations, uh, they generate heat due to those, and uh, that's how uh, you know this uh, the, this based uh, the um, gold gold nanoparticles. Um, um, 2D materials like uh, molybdenum disulfate or 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 uh, uh, manganese dioxide they all follow this this uh, this type of uh, way to generate heat and uh, when you come to nanomaterials in the beginning uh, like I'm talking about back in 2012 2013 around that range the widely used for photothermal therapy is dyes basically NAR dyes um, because uh, they 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 are uh, like they are not like water soluble, but they are semi water soluble. And uh, so they need nanoparticles. And also they have a good uh, photothermal property. But um, these uh, neon infrared dyes, basically the ICG, which is a FDF approved dye, and also the IR780. So both of these dyes, uh, they are not like highly stable after the photothermal therapy, they easily get degraded. So that's the reason why they are uh, used for widely used for photothermal therapy. And uh, coming next to that is the carbon-based uh, nanoparticles. So graphene oxide was quite famous uh, in, back in 2014, um, and uh, and that is was used for every type of uh, other therapies too, like cancer, uh, gene delivery, drug delivery, and everything. And it it took a very deep interest in for uh, uh, for uh, photothermal therapy because of its of its uh, 2D structure and its optical properties. And uh, now coming back to this second, uh, the the third one is the metallic nanoparticles. Uh, these nanoparticles um, are basically composed of gold gold based materials, uh, silver, uh, Persian blue, the iron uh, iron based materials. Um, these materials uh, they they uh, they emit um, energy based on their shape. This shape defines uh, the how much amount of energy they, they they emit. So gold, when you compare between gold and rods to and stars, uh, the stars produce more heat compared to the rods. And uh, 
coming to the final one that is uh, right right now everyone is kind of exploring a lot and a, for photothermal therapy is the 2d material basically black phosphorus molybdenum disulfate any nanobotic any materials that is in the lanthanide series uh, have all been explored for for uh, for photothermal therapy and uh, if you see if you if you take a journal called advanced materials um you can see you know uh, at least uh, a month uh, at least two papers will be published on 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 these uh, 2d nanomaterials for photothermotherapy so it's quite, kind of like a, a field which is now, now widely explored now um so coming back to my first topic uh, for my first research topic um so this is the first topic i did in my phd uh, on photothermotherapy so here, what we did is that we collaborated with uh, uh, a professor, Weber Tesai from National Taiwan University, um, and he provided us uh, as vitreonic polymer lipid-based micelle nanoparticle. Um, so he provided us this, and we what we did is that we loaded that with a, a NIR dye, IR780, and we did the whole study, uh, you know, uh, studying them in the in vitro and, and in in vivo uh, tumor models, like the cervical uh, tumor models. And uh, so what 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 is vitreonic polymers? Basically, vitreonic polymers are the polymers are the materials that is having zero net charge. So they, do, they are not either positive, they are not either negative, they are zero. So these uh, uh, polymers, uh, they, they don't like uh, come in contact with any type of proteins that is in our blood. So basically, you know that uh, uh, nanoparticles, they have a great, uh, uh, basically cationic nanoparticles, they have a great uh, uh, interest towards uh, the blood proteins. They form protein corona and therefore they, they start to get aggregated in the, in the, in the blood. So these vitreonic polymers, they don't get aggregated in the blood and due to which they have long-term circulation in the body. Um, so, but uh, one interesting fact about this is that these hydronic polymers, uh, when they enter the tumor pH, that is less than 6.5, they become highly positive. Uh, they, 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 they charge, the surface charge is, turns from zero to, 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 to a positive charge of more than uh, uh, plus 20. And uh, due to which uh, they have, due to the positive charge, they easily can bind to the cell surface, cell surface, and uh, they're getting more uptaken by the by the tumor cells specifically. And uh, the second component in this uh, material is the IR seven eighty, the dye. So this is the dye which is used for photonotherapy. therapy, and uh, this particular dye is a heptamethyl dye, and it is having a very poor solubility, it's highly hydrophobic. It's having very poor solubility uh, in water, um, and also it has very poor solubility. Uh, I mean, uptake in the in the tumors, and they get cleared very fast in the blood, and and also they have potential toxicity. So that is the reason why we are using these dyes uh, incorporated in the nanoparticles. And uh, when you use them in the nanoparticle formulation, they can be used for different types of uh, um, uh, therapies. Like for example, photothermal, photodynamic, and also you can also image uh, them. Uh, uh, you can do a live cell, a live uh, animal imaging also, and uh, see like where they exactly are, like how the particles are accumulated. And uh, so we use this formulation, and 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 also we did an intravenous uh, delivery uh, in a, in a TC1 xenograft tumor model. Uh, this is a nude mouse. Um, and uh, and uh, we developed this tumor model by injecting the cells, cancer cells, subcutaneously. And uh, once the size of this uh, this uh, tumor reaches 100 mm, then we started the therapy. We injected uh, the nanoparticles intravenously, and then we like we checked like what what time point they have a high um, uh, accumulation in the in the tumor. And uh, once we fix that that time point, uh, we do the uh, laser radiation um, and uh, we have uh, used 808 laser and uh, the 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 clinically approved uh, uh, I mean like preclinically approved uh, uh, power is uh, 2 watt per centimeter square and after radiation we also check uh, the superficial temperature using a thermal camera and we check whether they have reached the ablation temperature or not um, so 
and uh, overall this uh, nanomaterial uh, is uh, is you can be is uh, considered as a thermostatic nanoparticle is because it can be used for both therapy and also for diagnosis um so so this uh, from this uh, publication that we got two points over here the 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 uh, the uh, the significance of using uh, zeutronic nano uh, zeutronic polymers uh, which can have a great replacement for peg peg is uh, is a widely used used uh, nanoparticle uh, sort of polymers for uh, for uh, anti fouling or for preventing any type of uh, you, know, you know protein corona formation but uh, peg ha itself is having uh, some issues nowadays is because it can also generate antibodies uh, when you do a second type uh, in injection so the nowadays peg is uh, quite kind of a material that is uh, like highly getting replaced with other type, different types of uh, of nanomatic uh, na uh, nanomaterials um so zeutronic polymers is one of them and um, and uh, and uh, and more important from this uh, study that we also like found that this uh, nanoparticle formulation increases the stability of the dye and also enhances the uh, the photothermal heat conversion in the tumor so starting with the, the first data that we obtained is the characterization of this nanoparticle so we check uh, the size of the nanoparticles uh, in an uh, transmission electron microscope and also we check them the hydrodynamic size in uh, in uh, dynamic light scattering uh, instrument like called zeta sizer so based on the on the on the chem image that we saw that um, uh, the the nanoparticle the polymer alone the polymer with the lipid alone has a size around 208 nanometer um, but uh, when we loaded the nan nanoparticle with ir780 dye it the size slightly increased like 100 nanometer uh, increase uh, which is also we can also see that the core is kind of a little bit darker which means that uh, the the dye is getting aggregated within the nanoparticle so we, we confirm that okay the nanoparticle is formed and the dye is inside uh, this uh, micellar nanoparticles and one more uh, way we confirmed that this nanoparticles uh, this uh, dye is loaded inside the in the nanoparticle is using the absorbance um, so you can see that the blue line is the, just the ir780 dye which is having uh, absorbance at eight not around eight uh, 700 to 800 but when we uh, loaded these uh, when these uh, loaded nanoparticles they uh, when we loaded this ir780 nanoparticles in in ir780 uh, dye in the in the lipid nanoparticles we saw they are trying to get aggregated and this aggregation provides a red shift. I mean, like there is a 15 nanometer shift towards 8.03, eight, eight so which signifies that um, that uh, that uh, the 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 the, the, the IR eighty is loaded inside the nanoparticles and it's not binding over on the on on the surface of the nanoparticles. And uh, more important part of this study is also to check the stability of the of the of the nanoparticles and how it can protect the the dye from from uh, from the light. So what we did is that we incubated the the, the nanoparticles uh, uh, in open uh, daylight for uh, 24 hours, and we checked uh, the absorbance. You, so you can see here that IR 780 alone it is getting degraded, and its absorbance is reducing drastically within 24 hours. But uh, the the coming to the lipid nano, nanoparticle formulations, you can see that it still have some um uh, absorbance are uh, still retained in, uh, by the material which means that the degradation happens but it happens in a very slow rate compared to the free dye and uh, and also the final thing that we checked where it's very important to check is uh, whether they can generate heat so we checked uh, the um uh, the uh, heat generation by the nanoparticles at different uh, concentration and uh, we found that uh, you know the more the concentration the increase in the concentration you get increase in temperature in a short duration of time so you can see that 54 microgram versus 3.45 microgram per ml uh, the temperature rise is like kind of uh, dif uh, different so you can see that you can reach uh, the ablation temperature quickly with 54 microgram whereas uh, uh, 
um, the uh, 3.5 microgram, you can like see there's not only a minimal increase in the temperature. And uh, so the optimal uh, concentration that we can use for, for any therapy is uh, around uh, between uh, 7 to 14 microgram per ml. So between this uh, range, you can see that it's uh, having almost like more than the, uh, the temperature that we needed. Um, so we tested these nanomaterials in, in in vitro condition first, and uh, we saw um, that uh, that uh, the cells able to tolerate uh, this uh, nanomaterial and as well as the dye up to a concentration of 13.5 for AR780 and for 250 microgram for 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 uh, for the lipid. And uh, so what we did is we used less below this concentration because any material you give in excess have a potential toxicity so it is that we in this by this uh, in vitro study we we checked whether uh, how how what is the actual concentration they can tolerate and uh, and uh, we tested maximum the ic50 value of around 115.5 microgram and at 15.5 microgram you can see that um, they have a great uh, uh, without laser they have a good uh, um, uh, viability but when you apply laser to them the the viability of the cells uh, reduce drastically um, below uh, 20 percentage and also we did the imaging of this we did a live and cell death Im uh, cell, uh, dead cell imaging and uh, you can see here in the control uh, groups uh, that with and without uh, the laser uh, you can see the green ones are the live cells the, the red ones or the dead cells. So you can uh, you can see that the, the the green cells are quite higher, whereas there is no red cells uh, found. Uh, not very minimal uh, amount of uh, red cells found in, in in the control groups. But uh, when you come to the nanoparticle treatment, only we see we observe that only with the laser you find a lot of dead cells compared to the to the to the one without laser. So, which means that uh, the cells are only getting killed only when you apply laser, and not without laser, they they are pretty much safe. So then we moved actually towards the in vivo, but this is the first thing that we do when we do a nanoparticle study. Uh, we check the distribution of this nanoparticle in tumor mice at different time points. We check. So we injected uh, this. Uh, 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 we injected like around uh, 15 uh, microgram per kg of mice, uh, per kg of uh, per kg of uh, the nanoparticle IR780 uh, in, in, in the in the xenograft uh, tumor model, and we checked uh, the 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 fluorescence intensity of the IR780 at different time points in the imaging system, and we found that. Um, that uh, the IR780 alone has a huge increase, a uh, huge accumulation in the in the lung. Uh, uh, you can see that they have like around. Uh, this is a 24-hour uh, uh, hour uh, imaging, and you can see that they have a huge accumulation in the lung um, compared. Uh, whereas the nanoparticle one doesn't have a very minimal amount of uh, uh, drug accumulation in the lung. And uh, but uh, when it comes to tumor accumulation, the the IR seven eighty has very minimal amount of uh, dye in the in the in the uh, in the tumor, whereas uh, the IR seven eighty with the lipid nanoparticles have more accumulation in the tumor. So this uh, by distribution is the one which defines uh, like how much amount of heat can be generated um, uh, in the in the tumor. So you can see here is that with the due to the less accumulation of uh, of the dye in uh, of the IR seventy dye alone in the tumor, you can only able to reach a temperature around 45, uh, 45 degrees Celsius, which is less than the ablation temperature that we want to achieve. But uh, when you come to the to the lipid nanoparticles ones, you can see that it is having more than the the ablation temperature, and uh, and you have to maintain this temperature for at least a minimum of ten minutes uh, to reach a proper. Uh, uh, tumor ablation and uh, that what we have achieved here and due to which um, uh, you can see that the, the 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 treatment doesn't have any effect towards the, the health of the mice so we have checked the body weight and uh, the mice uh, body uh, they they are pretty much healthy they have maintained the same uh, body weight uh, till the end of the study 
um, and uh, when we check the tumor volume, you can see here is that um, the the last the blue line, the tumor volume of the laser ablated with with uh, the in, uh, the injected nanoparticles is showing like drastically redu reduced. Um, we also like found like three or four mice having no tumor at all. But whereas you see that with the IIS community due to its, uh, uh, you know, uh, due to its poor uh, heat generation, the, the, the tumor reduction is not that great and it's still keep increasing uh, slowly. And, uh, and uh, this uh, is the final data for this study. And after that, we did a histology for all the organs. And uh, we found that uh, that uh, the we didn't find any kind of significant toxicity in the other tissues and the tumor for IR-780 and, and the lipid nanoparticles. But in the laser treatment, what we have observed is that uh, there is a like a kind of uh, um, uh, there are a lot of apoptotic cells are there, a lot of necrotic cells are there, uh, which define which says that uh, that, that that the photothermal therapy. Um, uh, the heat uh, has uh, induced uh, uh, induced uh, necrosis and apoptosis in the tumor. So overall, uh, from this study, what we conclude is that uh, that uh, this lipid uh, nanoparticle loaded with IR seven eight is high, highly stable. Um, um, you know, uh, at uh, you know various uh, temp uh, temperatures and and uh, normal conditions, they are biocompatible. Com and uh, they have excellent uh, heat conversion property. And, uh, and more important is that the zitronic pro property of this uh, nanomaterials uh, help in prolonged circulation uh, in the blood. So you can see that uh, from my biodistribution bio data that they are having uh, 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 like a circulation like more than, uh, uh, more than uh, 48 hours and, uh, and uh, and they have a huge accumulation in the, in, the, in the tumor. And due to that reason why they have like, uh, they can be able to generate effective uh, heat and due to which uh, we can get uh, more cell death in, in, the, in the tumor. And uh, so this, uh, this is the end of this topic. Um, when, before I go move to my next topic, I would like to like give a, a brief introduction about what it is actually. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a about photothermal therapy, but it's a different uh, scenario. Like it's it involves immune uh, immune response in that. So when we did this experiment, so you can see that um, that the tumor volume has completely or drastically reduced here. So in this uh, group, uh, there are a few mice that was like completely the tumor was eliminated from the from the mice. So I left those mice um, in in the cage, and I and I have forgotten about that mice for for some time, like around like uh, a week and week and a half. Um, but uh, later on, when I came back to check them, they had a tumor size uh, similar to that of the control uh, groups. So this was uh, kind of a surprising because uh, we have eliminated the tumor completely, but how come they are coming back again? Um, so this is the question I asked a friend of mine, Kondar uh, Chirpula, and uh, what he did is that, okay, let me test them. So what he did is that he used uh, liposomes and he loaded with the ICG. It's also an, another type of uh, NAR dye. And uh, he did the uh, injection and uh, in, in, uh, in a normal mice, he, did. he didn't do it in the new mice, he did in normal mice. And he checked uh, uh, the the photothermal property of, of this uh, ICG loaded uh, liposomes. And uh, what interesting fact that he found from his studies that, um, that uh, the tumor, um, uh, when it's ablated at day one, it slowly, you know, started to come back uh, after, you know, like a day seven and day 14 and day 15, like as at the time progress, it's tumor, the tumor is started, the ablated tumor started to grow back and it's growing twice the size of the control. And when he checked the, the immune profile and, 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 and also the cytokines from this, and he found that there's a huge expression of immune suppressive, immune suppressive um, elements, like for example, the PDL1, ID1, TGF beta, IL6. These are the things that is like, that they, they, they basically inhibit any type of immune activation. Uh, in the tumor. 
and uh, due to this reasons uh, why we found a huge increase in the in 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 in, in the tumor regrowth um so so then we started to study more uh, of, of for any therapies like we do we also we do cancer chemotherapy we do gene therapy any therapy we started to like see uh, the aspects in terms of immune response so that uh, that only can that we kill the cancer cells, but we are not seeing what happens after after uh, it, it is getting killed. So we started to do more uh, uh, reading and and also more exper experimentations, and we found that okay, so what happens after you do photodynamic therapy or any type of photodynamic therapy? So you see that uh, the 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 dead cells, basically the necrotic cells or, or the apoptotic cells, they get uptaken by the by the resident uh, immune cell, uh, uh, antigen processing cells like dendritic cells here, and um, these dendritic cells they basically migrate towards the tumor draining lymph node, and uh, in the tumor draining lymph node they cross present these antigens to the T lymphocytes, helper T lymphocytes, and these helper T, T lymphocytes. Then they basically activate the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which later then they go and kill the remaining cancer cells. So this is the cycle that basically any type of uh, therapy follows. Sorry. Um, so if this cycle prolongs well, then you will have uh, memory immune cells like CD4 and CD8 immune cells. And uh, uh, and uh, this uh, immune cells they keep check on on on, on tumor recurrence and any any future potential of uh, uh, metastasis. Um, but uh, this process is not like as easy as it seems because there are a lot of immune suppressive elements uh, that is also produced post these therapies that blocks this cycle. Um, so uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the scenario is this uh, that uh, the immature dendritic cells in the tumor they basically lost the property to to migrate to the to, to the tumor draining lymph node. Um, so to improve that uh, to improve its migration and uh, towards the tumor draining lymph node, we can like use the different types of adjuvants. Um, basically, cytokines adjuvants uh, you can use uh, to improve its maturation and also to improve its uh, migratory property. But even after doing all those things, we still faced a lot of uh, issues in terms of enhancing the anti-tumor immune response. So we looked in depth and we found that what is the actual reason for uh, tumor remission um, post the photothermal therapy. So when you give a laser and uh, there are like few cells uh, in the tumor like they are killed and then there will be like a remaining cell uh, cancer cells in the in the in the in the tumor and uh, so these uh, killed cells will activate the immune cells and these immune cells will then infiltrate uh, into the tumor so along with uh, the infiltration of our cytotoxic T lymphocytes uh, cd8 cd4 there is also infiltration of MDSCs. It's called myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Uh, they basically like a non-differentiated myeloid cells. So these cells also infiltrate uh, uh, into the into the into the tumor. And after that, what happens is that they secrete a lot of anti-inflammatory proteins like IL-10, TG for beta. And um, these uh, cytokines, uh, they later activate uh, T regulatory cells like CD4, FOXP3, T regulatory cells. These cells basically they inhibit uh, the infiltrating uh, activated uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So this way, this MDSC is also like they also like help in metastasis of uh, the cancer cells. So we found like the huge infiltration of post uh, photothermal therapy. We found huge infiltration of MDSCs in the tumor, and we thought, okay, this is the reason why the tumor is recurring back. And um, then that time we were trying to find a solution to block this MDSCs. So we came across uh, this uh, drug called Resicumoid, uh, which is a, a TLR7-8 agonist. It's, a, it's, a, it's, used, it's, it's in clinical trial. It's widely used for tropical cancers, uh, melanoma, um, because it is a very toxic in systemic uh, delivery. So it's used as a, as a, also as a tropical treatment. And this TLR7 antagonist, um, basically, the you know that the most immune cells they have uh, toll-like receptors that uh, 
um, that respond that uh, respond to any type of foreign antigens like for example bacteria lps uh, uh, dna single single standard rna any any type of foreign uh, foreign materials they re respond to this uh, toll like receptor um, so one particular is that toll like receptor 7 and 8 has, has a very huge potential in terms of uh, anti tumor immune responses because when you activate tlr 7 and 8 um, uh, most of the cancer cells they produce a lot of and, uh, inflammatory cytokines uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, those cytokines uh, chemokines that activates uh, the other T lymphocytes um, and uh, therefore you will have uh, like a huge inhibition of uh, of uh, tumor progression uh, also angiogenesis etc. So we so uh, during this time, like 2016, we found only one paper that published uh, the, the influence of R848 in MDNCs. And this is this paper is the beginning for our research on MDNCs actually, um, because uh, this paper they have showed that how RCQ mod inhibits uh, uh, the MDNC population in the tumor. And you can see here in this paper is that. Uh, that uh, MDSC is uh, expressing um, CD11B and GRV1. Uh, when they are treated with the resicumoid, uh, different date, uh, time points, you can see that they, they, the population of uh, uh, the expression of uh, this uh, particular uh, GR, GR1, which is the MDSC marker, is reduced significantly from, like you can see that, 51 and 36. So it is reducing that. So we thought, okay, maybe yes, R848 is the potential candidate for reducing MDSC. So we start, we thought to like, you know, use this, uh, use this drug for, for studying um, uh, the, uh, uh, studying the role of MDSCs in photodermal therapy. So I collaborated with a, one of my colleague, a friend of mine, uh, Vishnu Ravery. Um, uh, he's currently a postdoc in here in, in, in Temple University, uh, Philadelphia. Um, he developed a, 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 a thermoreversible hydrogel, uh, which is a, like a gel that, that solidifies only, it is an injectable form, it's a liquid form, but it will be solidified only when you inject in the tumor and uh, you can use that for, for, for any type of drug delivery or any type of uh, gene delivery or for current case we have used for photothermal therapy. Uh, we checked this in the triple negative breast cancer tumor model. Um, so the reason why we went from uh, systemic to lo local is because um, the systemic delivery, you know, even though in clinically it ha we have easy, it has easy access uh, to different parts of the body. You know, if you in inject the nanoparticles intravenously, you know, it can go to any type of tissues that we want. Uh, it's pretty non-invasive, and uh, um, but the problem is that uh, that that you know it is known right now is that only one percentage of whatever drug you are, that you are injecting is going to the targeted tissues or tu tumor uh, which is pretty less and uh, it will be, be very difficult to achieve that uh, that therapeutic concentration in the tumor and um, more important is that um, uh, uh, that uh, the that these nanoparticles has to has to face that uh, the protein corona uh, the one that is uh, blocking uh, and and uh, reducing the long term circulation of, of the nanoparticle. So due to this reason, we switched it from systemic delivery to local delivery. And look, one of the advantage of local delivery is that whatever uh, concentration of drug that you are injecting, it's hundred uh, percent going to that particular tissue, and it's not going to any other tissues. Um, and uh, you can control, you regulate how much dose you can give here. So if you want to give five microgram, you are giving exactly five microgram of drug to the tissues. So that's the one of our advantage of uh, local delivery. But the problem is here is that you have to have easy access to the tumor. Um, so you cannot give this for uh, for metastatic lesions in the lungs. You know, you cannot do local therapy for metastatic lesions in the lungs. You can do for like, for example, for brain tumors, you can do for breast cancer, you can do. Um, and sometimes even uh, like if we have a, a, a instrument called colonoscopy, you can also do the same injection for um, for uh, for colorectal cancers. And uh, for this uh, particular study, we used three different components. Um, one is uh, uh, hyaluronic acid, which is a, a, a carbohydrate polymer um, that is widely used in, in 
in you know it is a fda approved uh, carbohydrate uh, polymer um and uh, next one is pluronix f127 so you know you see this two materials are used widely in cosmetics um so what we did is that we used this we mixed this two uh, uh, materials together at a particular ratio and uh, we formed a hydrogel so they basically form hydrogel um uh, but they are they are they are, they are basically uh, liquid at at uh, temperature less than 4 degree but they, when they reach uh, the body temperature at 37 they are coming back to uh, the, the solid uh, the, the solid property come is uh, is retained and uh, for photothermal therapy the basically what i used here is a, is a manganese dioxide based nanoparticle um, I have published a paper uh, uh, showing uh, uh, this, the property of this uh, nanoparticle in sepsis. Um, but uh, this is the first time that we are showing it is having photothermal property also. Um, so this nanomaterial we, we, we developed uh, using albumin uh, protein, basic albumin serum protein. And we mixed it with the KMNO4. Uh, and uh, this, uh, what happens is that the the, the functional groups like carboxylic uh, groups and amine groups on on the, on on the surface of the protein, they basically reduce the KMnO4 to MnO2, and due to which they form uh, they sediment over these uh, proteins and they form this MnO2 bound albumin nanoparticles. So this is what we have used for for photothermal therapy because it, it is widely used for photothermal therapy through nowadays because uh, um, it, it can easily generate heat um, and upon laser radiation and second thing is that it is used for other type of uh, modality also like for example MRI contrast it's a use is a very potent T1 uh, MRI contrast it's uh, now we have studied its anti-inflammatory uh, property. Uh, in different types of uh, inflammatory diseases and also like you know that the tumor has a hypoxic region and uh, this MnO2 nanoparticles are widely used for for uh, an, an anti-hypoxia and also for uh, oxygenating the tumor for photodynamic therapy. So we combined all these three components together to form this particular hydrogel. Um, so as I said before, they are liquid at, uh, at degree, four degrees Celsius, but uh, when they are uh, reaching the body temperature, they become a soft gel. So that when after soon after you inject it, they become like a, they, like a gel and they hold the drugs, whatever that you have uh, injected in, in, the, in the tumor. And when you give a laser at 808, the temperature reaches, uh, when they reaches beyond 48 to 49 degrees Celsius, they start to become a hard gel and so the drug is even retained more and it's not released fast. So you can see here is that, um, that, uh, that uh, at four degrees Celsius, uh, these are like, uh, you know, they, 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 they are in the liquid form. And once uh, they have reached uh, 37 degrees Celsius, they are retained in the tube, which means that they have got solidified um and uh, more important thing about uh, this particular um property of this hydrogel is that you know the bm nanoparticles when they are in the solutions they they don't uh, uh, produce much heat um uh, upon laser but uh, when they are in the hydrogel formulation they produce even more heat you can see from this uh, data is that uh, the mno nanoparticles uh, when they the highest concentration is 0.4 mg per ml. You can see that they have reached only the temperature around 37 degrees Celsius um, uh, for a 12, 12 minutes time point. But when you see the hydrogel formulation, they have reached quickly to a temperature of 45 to 47 degrees Celsius, which means that the hydrogel uh, formulations uh, provides this type of aggregations, uh, which helps in producing more type, more amount of heat uh, uh in in a short period of time and uh, more important thing is that uh um, that uh, due due to this hydrogel the drug is not like released pretty fast because you can see that the 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 drug release uh, is pretty slow uh, pretty higher in 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 terms of uh, bare drug but when you are using the hydrogel formulations the the drug 20 percentage of drug is still retained after even after after five days of incubation so which means that uh, they they keep the drug for longer duration time um, uh, compared to the free drug in, in uh, administration so overall uh, this uh, nanomaterials is what we have used for the next 
coming uh, therapy uh, study. Um, so here, what we did is that we have used a 41, uh, it's a metastatic uh, breast cancer tumor model. Uh, so we did, a, uh, we injected that in, the, in the subcutaneously and uh, we injected the hydrogel um, at day zero. And then we have did the la laser radiation soon after that. Uh, we used 808 nanometer laser for two watt per centimeter square for 10 minutes. And we have uh, used uh, two types of uh, two types of hydrogels here. So one which is having no uh, R848, one which is having uh, R848. So both these uh, temperatures, uh, both these hydrogels have the photosensitizer. So they, uh, the temperature that we generated in both is pretty much the same. Uh, so it is uh, reaching about 50 three to 54. Um, and uh, so the only difference is what we have here is the drug, the R848. So now we are able to study like what is the influence of R848 uh, in, 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 in anti-tumor activity and also in anti-tumor immune response. So what we found is that you can see that the, the, the R8, uh, the, uh, the laser with uh, the hydrogel, the laser with the uh, um, without the R848, it shows that, like there is a slight increase in the tumor volume, and if you keep it for a long time, it, it definitely like it will prolong. Uh, it it will still grow, but uh, when it comes to the um, the R848 loaded with the laser one, you can see that the tumor is completely reduced and it's almost like disappearing um, in few of those mice. Um, but uh, but other than that, R848 doesn't have any great influence in. Um, uh, they have some influence in in, the, in in tumor reduction, whereas the not not much uh, uh, like not that great uh, significant effect. Um, and uh, and the more important is that uh, the in terms of uh, with and without R848 uh, in laser ablated tumors, we didn't find any difference in terms of. Uh, uh, tumor, uh, uh, other types of uh, um, uh, uh, phenomenon like the splenomegaly, you you can see that uh, the the spleen basically they enlarges in 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 a tumor uh, tumor model or in, in in any patients they basically they have a huge uh, spleen. It's called splenomegaly because it's a sign of metastasis. Um, but in our therapy, we didn't find uh, we found that the the, the spleen is a, uh, is of a normal size and it didn't increase. Uh, but we didn't find any difference between uh, the the R eight four eight and without R eight four eight laser ablated ones. And also, you can see um, that uh, in the uh, histology, immunohistochemistry, chemistry, whether we found, we did uh, we, we didn't find there is no difference between the apoptosis uh, or the necrosis between um, the two groups, uh, the basal and the basal R eight four eight. And also the proliferation. Also, you can see that the the, the K sixty seven staining it, it defines uh, cell proliferation. So you see huge proliferation of uh, of uh, cells in the in the in the controlled PBS groups. But you cannot find that in the in the laser ablated tumors. But uh, uh, you can see closely that the basal and basal R for it didn't have any significant difference in terms of that too. But one thing that we found the difference is in the MDSC population actually, uh, which was the interesting factor that, that uh, boosted us to like proceed with this study actually. So you can see that, um, that uh, the uh, control have a huge amount of MDSCs uh, in the tumor, but uh, the laser uh, ablated one has less, but uh, when you compare that with the R848 uh, treatment, that it is completely drastically and like significantly lower, um, and and more specifically, when we found that the MDSCs, uh, there are like two different populations of MDSCs that are there. There is one is granulocytic and there is monocytic. So we specifically saw that monocytic uh, MDSCs were like lower in 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 the R848 uh, compared to the uh, without R848 laser ablated ones. And uh, the second thing that we found uh, also interesting is that um, this uh, uh, treatment also increased the expression of uh, in an inflammatory cytokines, especially the IF and gamma and IL-12P. Also, we found TNF alpha IL-6 also were like highly expressed uh, in the R848 laser treatment ones compared to the without R848 laser treatment ones. 
and uh, and uh, more interesting point is that uh, due to the increase in this high dscs we found uh, the expression of uh, il10 and uh, tgf beta these are the pro uh, anti inflammatory cytokines uh, produced by the mdscs they were like kind of higher in the laser treatments uh, whereas you can see that uh, the r848 laser treatment doesn't have much so overall from this study what we have concluded in from this study we have concluded is that the the um, the laser kills um, the the tumor and the tumors uh, dead cells they they getting uptaken by the mature dendritic cells and um, these uh, mature dendritic cells uh, they produce a lot of ifn and gamma which will activate the cd18 phosphates directly um but uh, what is the significant role of r848 is that r848 blocks this mdscs and therefore it prevents uh, any type of uh, um, immune suppression towards the cd18 lymphocytes so this is how this whole mechanism we have concluded the whole mechanism works so we found okay so now the there is a huge increase in 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 in, in systemic inflammation and huge increase in in, in infiltration of uh, cytotoxic t lymphocytes uh, in the tumor. So what is the actual role in terms of metastasis? So what we did is that we have used a different type of a model. It's called uh, Obscobal model. So it's a bi bilateral tumor. So we inject in the same mice, we inject two tumors. Um, one we called primary tumor and the second we call it as uh, the secondary tumor. The primary tumor will be injected with 1 million cells. Uh, and the secondary tumor will be in, uh, injected with 100,000 cells, which is less compared to the primary one. And uh, one, once we reach uh, the temperature, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the tumor volume to 100 mm for the primary tumor, uh, we do the treatment. And after that, we monitor the, the tumor volume of both the primary and the secondary tumor. And uh, from this study, we found uh, that um, the, um, the primary uh, tumor and the secondary tumor, they, they both show the same uh, uh, phenomenon, the anti-tumor activity. They both have the same one. Um, the more interestingly, you can see that uh, the basal r for it laser treatment one, the tumor injected, uh, uh, the secondary tumor that is injected they had, didn't have much growth at all. Uh, it is completely suppressed or its its growth is completely retarded. So, which means that uh, there is some type of anti-tumor immune response which is blocking the growth of uh, this tumor cells. So, we did immune profiling. Uh, we checked um, the uh, immune cells in the primary secondary tumor. Uh, we checked the immune cells in the, in the tumor draining lymph node. We checked in the spleen. We checked in the blood plasma. At different time points, we checked uh, day 7, day 14, and day 21 post the therapy. And uh, what interesting facts that we found from this data is that we found a huge in the secondary tumor, basically. But a primary tumor, basically, what the previous data showed, it's the same. But the secondary tumor, what we found is that there is a huge increase of, uh, of um, CD8 and CD4 T lymphocytes in the tumor. Especially at day seven and day fourteen, you can see that CD8 IFN gamma, which is the activated T lymphocytes, are find, kind of found to be higher in terms of basal R848 laser ones compared to the basal laser ones alone. So, which means that, uh, and and also that you can see that uh, the level of MDSCs also were lower in terms of basal um, R848 laser. So, uh, which means that uh, blocking MDSCs. Uh, we found an increase in, in, in the infiltration of uh, CD8 uh, IF and gamma T cells. And uh, more in interesting fact is that we also found inflammatory macrophages were also like kind of uh, in, uh, like level of inflammatory macrophages were also higher uh, in, in the, in the basal right for it, laser treatment ones. Uh, and also the tumor, uh, tumor associated macrophages that is called M2 macrophages um, were lower uh in 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 the in the in the final treatment once so so overall uh, from this we what we found is that when we do uh when we treat the primary tumor it also affects the secondary tumor um but uh we wanted to know like in detail like what happens actually and we found that uh uh, the, the the reduction of mdscs in the primary tumor is also affecting 
the level of MDSC is in the, in the secondary tumor. Uh, we still have no idea why it is that, but we are still exploring uh, that part of uh, part of the, that study. Um, and also we want to know what is the significant role of uh, M1 and M2 macrophages in this photothermal therapy. And those are the studies that we are still, you know, uh, keep doing uh, nowadays. And uh, this is the most important uh, part of our work. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's the part where we, we have, uh, which encouraged us to continue this work more. Um, the reason is that because um, to un understand this particular data, you have to understand what is actually the immune, tumor immune microenvironment. So basically you can see that um, there are any tumor, there are two types of tumors basically within that. Uh, it's categorized de depending on the tumor immune microenvironment. So there's a cold tumor, there's a hot tumor. So hot tumors are basically the tumors that is having huge amount of uh, um, T lymphocytes, uh, immune cells, and, and antigen presenting cells, everything. So they, they, they have all type of uh, immune cells inside the tumor. And uh, these basically, they are like kind of a little bit suppressed. So you just, they need some help to get uh, uh, activated so that we can do it using uh, the current uh, antibody therapies uh, to activate them. So these hot tumors basically they respond easily to the checkpoint immune uh, immune checkpoint blockade therapy like PDL1 and anti-PD1 that is recently FDA approved. But the problem is that the cold tumors which are some patients have they basically don't respond to those therapies is because the reason is that they don't have any type of um, uh, any type of immune cells immune cells like T lymphocytes in the in the in the tumor, um, and uh, and due to which uh, they po they poorly respond to the to the to the immune checkpoint blockade. Um, but uh, what we found is that um, we are able to convert these cold tumors into hot tumors. Um, uh, due to this therapy, we found that this, this cold tumor is converted to hot tumors. And the reason how we found is that we saw a huge infiltration of CD8 and CD4 T lymphocytes that is expressing PD1. So, which means that these are kind of called as exhausted T lymphocytes, which means um, these uh, once uh, the infiltrated T lymphocytes uh, entering the tumors and they do all the uh, type of killing of cancer cells, they slowly start to like uh, getting exhausted and they start to express PD, uh, PD1 um, uh, proteins on, 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 the, on the cell surface and due to which uh, uh, they, they will again can go back to the immune suppressive uh, uh, condition. So we can block this, um, this uh, um, CD4 and um, CD8 PD1 expressing uh, T lymphocytes using the immune current uh, immune checkpoint blockade therapies. So this photothermal therapy, in combination with the immune checkpoint blockade, can synergistically work together. So that is what what we found using this particular um, uh, particular study. And more important is that uh, we also like found uh, that in the bilateral tumor model, we also found IL-12P uh, expression were kind of higher with our final treatment. But uh, the IL-10 and il uh, t all were also like significantly reduced compared to the compared to the um, to the PBS control and as well as to the laser uh, alone treatment groups too. So overall, um, this is my final conclusion: is that uh, uh, that uh, we have developed a hydrogel that is uh, in, is an injectable form, so you can use it directly as an injection. Uh, but it, you have to maintain that temperature to four degree, and uh, so they are um, the after injecting in the in the body uh, temperature they kind of form a semi solid hydrogel, and due, due to the laser they form a solid hydrogel, and uh, this helps both in drug retention and also for improving the photothermal heat conversion, and uh, more to this then we found that um, that. Uh, that uh, using R848 in, incorporated in this hydrogels, uh, we blocked MDSCs and also we improved the maturation and, uh, and of the DCs and also we improved the, the infiltration of cytotoxic T lymphocytes in the tumor. And moreover, we found that, the, that this activation of this systemic 
um, uh, anti-tumor immune response also can affect the distal, the secondary tumor uh, in, in, in the body. So that, 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 that we have studied in detail in, the, in, in this particular um, study. So the, what is the current challenges uh, that we are facing currently right now? Because uh, right now I'm trying to apply for many grants here. Um, and uh, most of the time when we apply for photothermal therapy, they, get, they basically get rejected for three reasons actually, because uh, one reason is that you don't have uh, a technology that, uh, that can easily access uh, tumors. For example, you cannot access using lasers to pancreatic cancer. You can easily access uh, for lung cancer, you cannot use a laser. So those, uh, uh, those are the pretty much the, the basic challenges. Um, which, which I cannot work uh, basically, um, but uh, these are the things that is uh, like undertaken by any kind of physics uh, background person or, or in electronics or, or in, in photo optics. So those kind of people are trying to work on this part. Um, and uh, what the part I am like have to focus on is that uh, photorealism thermal therapy induces this immune suppression. So here I showed you that uh, MDSCs is one of the factors that but there are a lot of other factors also that can also suppress the anti-tumor immune response. And, uh, and finally coming uh, to the final part is that, that these nanometers that we develop has some kind of toxicity in long-term run, not in short-term run. And uh, with the current animal models that we have, it is very difficult to study that. Um, so more and more, uh, uh, technologies and informations we need uh, to to study um, this uh, toxicological uh, uh, properties of this uh, nanometers that we develop. So yeah, so this is the end of my topic on research. So finally, coming to the career advice. So I'm not an expert in this, but I will give you with what knowledge or, or 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 the experience i have in 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 this in this field basically academia what i have um, so i am still in the beginning stage of an academia so my uh, my basic plan uh, uh, after my postdoc is like i have two streams to decide one is academia and one is industry so in academia for example in us if you see so if you are a bachelor student, it will be very helpful to know that uh, there is a, like, a, you don't have to do a two years master's and then uh, five years of PhD. Here, there's an option called integrated PhD. Uh, it's available in most of the countries, basically, um, in both in US and also in, uh, and, uh, in uh, UK and also in, in Korea also, they have this, this, uh, this uh, category of uh, degree. So you can use this uh you can uh, do masters and then you can do phd or you can do both together um so it will be like uh, two plus three five years of uh, program and after doing that you will be going for a postdoc position so when you come to us you basically come with either two things one you will be coming with uh, uh your own fellowship so with if you have your own fellowship you are the king here uh, because uh, you just don't have to report to your current boss here and uh, you just have to report um, your data, your research, everything to the funding agency. Uh, and uh, and uh, you, 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 you have uh, your pay and your salary uh, until the, the, the funding agency like provides you because based on your progress in your research, they provide you um, the, 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 the salary. And uh, if you are coming with a PI funding, that is if you, are, if you have a found a PI here, a potential PI here, and you're coming with, you're joining his lab and you are using his funding, he basically give you, he or she give you uh, a one year uh, appointment. And later they basically extend uh, depending on the, your performance or depending on how much funding is left and et cetera. So, Basically, um, PI funding is kind of a tricky one uh, because uh, you get to be asked to leave the lab anytime. You know, basically they give a three months notice and if they have any funding issues in the lab, they basically can throw you out. So PA funding is pretty much, uh, you know, you have to be very careful when you're joining a lab. You have to be, you know, 
try to have uh, more conversations with your potential uh, um, PIs before joining the labs. So after that, you will be going for an after having a three years or four years of postdoc training, you if you if you if your PI or if your future PI has uh, as funding or 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 if you have a green card uh, and also if you have an NIH funding, um, you can be promoted to instructor job, and uh, this position will help you like you will be a subgroup leader uh, in in a, in a, in, a, in a lab. So your professor will be the main and you can be the one who will be handling most of the students and postdocs in the lab. And uh, you will be the one who will be in charge in, in, in doing all the management uh, activities in the lab, including your own research. Um, and after that, if you have uh, got early career funding, you will be promoted to assistant professor. There's two categories for this. One is you can be a hundred percent research professor. That means like you have hundred percent. You want to focus only on research, or you can focus on on um, uh, on um, eighty percent research and twenty percent on teaching. So for getting this position, you have to be like appointed uh, appointed uh, as a tenure track. Um, there's a tenure track and non tenure track here. So if you are a non tenure track, uh, means like you you will be like uh, asked to get funding from other sources and you have to sustain in that uh, university for quite long time to get to tenure track and uh, once you achieve that um, then it will be like easy for you to like for getting promoted to associate professor and then to professor so you can decide whether you want to do 80 percent research and 20 percent teaching then you can join a university or you can also join other research institutes or even university where you can be only research professor focusing 100% on research. You don't have to do any kind of teaching, but to survive in this uh, um, as a research professor, you have to like uh, have funding 100%. You should have funding from NIH or a non NIH uh, agency here. Um, otherwise, uh, because the university cannot support 100 percentage on fund, it can support like a basic like around 30 percentage they can support, but 70 percentage you have to get it from from outside sources. Um, and uh, more important, basically, professors in research uh, who are doing 100 percent research, if they basically get more fund and money from uh, starting uh, companies, they have a lot of uh, um, startups here. Um, there are a lot of things that is help, that is uh, like a uh, uh, lot of uh, companies here like they are called the startup accelerators uh, which will provide you the space uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and also the fund uh, to to develop your own company your startup company so for example here um, lab central here is my previous postdoctoral uh, professor uh, Natalie Adzi, she started a, a company called Biodevic. Um, and she was uh, like uh, improving her company uh, um, using this uh, particular uh, startup accelerator and uh, they provided her the lab space and everything. Um, and, and also they provide a pay for one person uh, who can you can employ uh, for this company. So that's the thing. And uh, more important in if you want to survive in academia, this is common everywhere. You know, I mean, like a, you should have publications. I mean, like a lot of publications. Um, you should have a grant or a fellowship. If you want, like you are in a postdoc, you should or instructor, you should have a fellowship. But uh, if you are a professor, you should have a grants in in your name. Um, uh, so to keep uh, your lab running. But if you once your funding or your grant is gone, then the university or the research institute they can easily you know throw throw the person out um, uh, stating that you don't have enough fund to run the lab so this is the whole how this uh, the whole scenario is happening in 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 us and if you have still some energy left in your uh, in you then you can like stick around the uh, um, the field for quite long time but you will not be holding any uh, position for this emirate professor position uh, because uh, uh, this stage you will be like uh, like uh, guiding as a guiding uh, other people other uh, junior professors and uh, junior uh, assistant professors 
and you will be like only a kind of a support in terms of knowledge and and, and experience um but uh, in korea is a different scenario is because uh, korea is a different uh, area i mean like in terms of culture and and in research uh, culture it's completely different um, um so i joined there as a phd student um then i learned that there is a like a master's degree with the phd integrated program so it's a two plus three five years uh, uh, degree program it is a uh, very helpful um, um and uh, also uh, to to have uh, progress in in terms of like you if you want to move faster in academia uh, korea is the best place for that because you can like quickly move on because when i joined in 2014 um uh 2014 i think uh my current pro professor my phd thesis professor was assistant professor by the time uh, i reached my fourth year of my phd he was a professor full-time professor actually uh in, in in academia so you can see that you can easily progress very fast uh in terms of korea in academia for academic sake and you can get full-time position there um but the only criteria you have there is you have to get uh, funding from from the uh from the outside source so basically the national research foundation of korea they are the most uh, they, they are the biggest funding agency um and uh, and uh, they basically they fund a huge amount it's suppose if you are collaborating with another professor like uh, two or three professors they provide huge funding like 10 million dollars or or 20 million dollars of funding they provide and uh, if you want to survive as a as an in academia as a professor in in korea the more important thing is that contacts you have to like talk and speak communicate with other professors um, uh, um in, in 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 korea and uh, for that you should basically have one important thing that is you should know korean language um because uh, some professors as not some most of the professors they they have little knowledge uh, in terms of english um but most of them can speak but uh, but korean language is very important there uh, and also like following their culture is also very important there um and um, the second thing is that uh, you should also like have uh, if you have more contacts more collaborations then you will your publication amount also will increase and you have chances for getting the grants uh, for the for your lab is is also like more with the more contacts so basically more you need more contacts uh, in in korea to 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 flourish uh, whereas uh, in in us uh, basically it's not like that much collaborative like few very few people collaborate but most of them they do their own individual research um and also if you suggest if you ask me like uh, like after bachelor degree can i directly join for masters and phd well then the scenario is that um, in korea they basically they don't uh, consider uh, your your uh, more than your marks and your 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 um, your cv they they mostly focus on recommendation so if someone of your friends or friends friends or someone is there uh, in korea is working as a postdoc or a phd they can easily can if they recommend to your to the to their pi and to their boss then the the process of recruiting is pretty easy you just have to give one interview and that's it you are you are in and um, and basically they provide a good uh, pay uh, in terms of the, like you, you you have for phd and your masters you have to pay from your pocket uh, for the fee and uh, that is like around twenty seven thousand uh, dollars but uh, you will be like mostly uh, getting uh, scholarships like around eight hundred dollars a month um, which can help in covering your your tuition fees and uh, and uh, and also your other expenses uh, during your stay in korea so the masters get 800 the, the phds are average around 1200 2800 they used to get uh, scholarships there um, that is also provided by your pi uh, not from any kind of funding agency so you don't have to worry about scholarships there uh, but uh, but in us you have to 100 you should have a fellowship uh, to enter a degree to enter phd basically um and uh, more important thing is that uh, korea is a very good country for starting companies if you have a good patent uh, you can easily start 
companies with my patents uh, my pi actually started a, a company um, which develops uh, magnesium dioxide and nanoparticles for for uh, mri contrast and also for uh, for for uh, hypoxia and also for uh, inflammation um and uh, if you want to join as a postdoc here you can join but you with the pa funding if you if you join as a phd and then you ask your pa that i want to continue as a postdoc they if they have fund they will definitely support you and uh, if you are a postdoc um uh, you 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 can get like uh, you after 2 years of postdoc experience you can be easily you can be transferred uh, I can upgrade it to research professor, which will have a little more high pay. Um, uh, but if you have funding called uh, this, this uh, most competitive funding uh, fellowship, it's called Korea Research Foundation for Postdoc Fellowship. If you have this funding, uh, this is life savior because uh, you will have funding for five years, um, and uh, the amount like per 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 year you will be having sixty two thousand dollars. Uh, which will cover all your, you know, personal uh, cost and living expenses and everything. And in addition, they also will provide you uh, uh, provide you the the funding for uh, research. So if you get this, this is a very highly competitive one. Uh, if you get this, this is a life savior for you, and uh, it will be very easy for you also to progress to other academic academic positions. Well, uh, coming to the pharma industry is like um, this. I have less experience um, because uh, I am just uh, pull down these informations uh, based on what I hear from my friends who are there already in the industry, and um, and most of them were like directly joined from PhD degree to uh, directly to as a as a as a research scientist in in in, in the in the companies. Um, so. After your PhD, maybe you can uh, directly join as a research scientist, depending on. But they basically ask for experience uh, uh, if you want to join uh, uh, their company. So what uh, basically nowadays they have started is that called industrial postdocs. So many companies like AstraZeneca and Novartis they have their own research institutes. Um, so you can just apply to those in the research institutes. Uh, whenever they have say that they we have a postdoc opening, you can apply and they will have a series of like five or six interviews uh, and then you can easily join uh, those uh, uh, those companies I mean like it will be very hectic uh, during the interviews but if you successfully completed this then they easily recruit you for that so they basically it will be like one year or two year uh, postdoc position and uh, if you were if you still wanted to stick with industry then you can like you know continue there but if you wanted to like, uh, you know, I just want to like go to academia, you can easily transform from industrial postdoc to academic uh, positions. Uh, so that is the one advantage of doing industrial postdoc because that is will give you some time to decide whether you want to stick in industry or you want to go more to academia or not. So after the research scientist, you basically, if you do three years of uh, postdoc, you automatically like upgraded to senior scientist position and then you will be like principal senior principal group leader and associate director after that uh, <laughs> there is a lot of other scenarios that you depends i mean like if you want if you are uh, very lucky you can be like a vice president ceo cco you know you can it go it goes up so it depends on how how potential you are in 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 the in the in that particular area and um, and these are the companies that are like currently like uh, the, the most famous popular uh, companies nowadays uh, recruiting quite frequently people. Um, so there are five things they expect from us basically uh, if you're in US uh, basically. Uh, one is that the, you need to have research skills that is very important. Um, so if you are uh, having uh, any particular specialization so if you say that I have uh, I'm I'm very much expert in organic chemistry and, and in and inorganic chemistry. Then Merck, Merck, and Sanofi, Merck, Bayer's they are recruiting mostly these kind of people for their company. And also Moderna nowadays uh, they are asking for more people who are uh, like uh, more um, uh, having knowledge in liquid-based nanoparticles and also like the gene delivery. Uh, gene-based deliveries who are expert in that so they are asking for people who are experienced with that 
um then the second thing comes is like the experience they ask is very important because you should have experience actually if you do if you do have completed master's degree you need at least five years of experience in industry or if you have completed phd you should have at least have two years of experience so depending on what degree you have uh, that uh, the experience they ask for and publications they basically they don't, they don't ask uh, what type of publication you have basically they ask publication because they want to know whether you have you have said the same but like if you say i have experience in inorganic chemistry i have did this particular particular reactions then they basically don't believe what you say they believe what publication uh, what the publication you have uh, says so they they see the publication and they see okay you have uh, uh, did this this uh, particular uh, experiments and uh, this is particular research you have did so Based on that, we will approve. Okay, we think that you really have this type of skill. So basically, that that's the reason they ask for publications. But they don't ask for many publications. They ask if you, even if you have two or three publications, that's more than enough. Um, and uh, and fourth point is key management skills. That is what they ask uh, widely uh, in in here in basically in US uh, for uh, for companies here. Um, that if you have uh, skills to manage a team of uh, postdocs or 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 uh, juniors or scientists or 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 or, or even you know if you upgrade you should have also like uh, handle a uh, uh, single projects uh, you have handled or not so they they ask those kind of uh, things for the beginners you 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 be asked uh, only if you have managed any students grand or graduates uh, during your phd degree or not or during your postdoc degree or not so that is what they basically ask and the fifth most important is like if you are applying in us green card is must because uh, to sponsor you for a h1b is a quite expensive one uh, but uh, if you have a green card they simply like close their eyes and they recruit you uh, so but to get a green card here is pretty difficult nowadays so you should be like uh, start planning that soon after you have uh, landed in United States. So that is the starting point. You have to start for deciding, like you have to like apply, how to apply for green card and everything. So if you have doubts on that, you can simply, you know, email me, I can share you with information, uh, like how we can do that. Um, but uh, other than that, if you have any questions related to this uh, particular uh, topic on career, uh, you can simply, you know, you can email me, you can, you know, check me on Facebook or 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 even uh, in LinkedIn. So yeah. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, please shoot. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for this wonderful lecture and enlightening us on the topic nanomaterial based uh, photothermal cancer therapy, and also on the career path. Uh, we have few questions uh, from the participants and. Uh, and the first one is what are the benefits of photothermal therapy when compared to the conventional therapy uh, so the conventional therapies are basically you know if you take uh, uh, the current uh, radiation therapy if you take uh, um, the radiation therapy basically the the issue with the radiation therapy is that they have a huge uh, um, uh, uh, effect towards the healthy tissues basically uh the free radicals that is generated within uh, the the uh, within the tumor uh due to the radiation can affect also uh, the healthy tissues and also the radiation also have a huge side effects but when you coming to the photothermal therapy photothermal therapy is the most localized and focused therapy here uh so you don't have you you can focus your lasers uh, which is a very focused one towards only the tumor re, tumor tissues and not to any other uh, uh, healthy tissues it doesn't spread over the heat that the generated heat does not spread to other other uh, parts of the body um, and uh, more important uh, is that uh, 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 the um, uh, the photothermal therapy is now at beginning stage it's still not like clinically used the clinically used one nowadays is uh, in terms of ablation is radio frequency ablation uh, where they insert the electrodes and uh, uh, they damage the tissues uh, but uh, uh, but uh, this photothermal therapy can uh, like avoid those things because the photothermal therapy can be able to provide you uh, reduce your side effects 
uh, that is caused by the radio frequency ablations. So yeah, that's my answer for that. I think you're satisfied with that answer. Yes, sir. so thank you. And the next question is, can quantum dots used for phototermal therapy? Uh, some, uh, some uh, are there. So like, uh, for example, uh, graphene quantum dots are there, uh, which can be used for that. Uh, but, uh, you know, any photothermal uh, therapy you, you take, it should have a, a, an observance at uh, 808 uh, range. Um, so if you have uh, a quantum dot that, that have absorbance and also have a low quantum yield, uh, it can be used for for uh, uh, for photothermal therapy, uh, but uh, but my friends have have uh, tested. Uh, they were they were they were working on on uh, on uh, graphene quantum dots uh, for photothermal therapy, and pretty pretty much worked. Yeah. Yes, sir. And the final question is: What is the cost difference between photothermal therapy and radiation therapy? How it differs, and which is more uh, cheaper and lighter way? Uh, I, I would say um, the laser uh, because uh, it depends uh, also, but because uh, uh, as I said, uh, you know, we are now currently working on, on developing technologies that can uh, enable us to access the tu tumor. I mean, like that access uh, the tumor easily using the laser. Um, so the current, uh, if you want to study uh, photothermal uh, therapy in your lab setup, it's pretty cheaper. You just have to spend around uh, $300, I believe um to get the laser but whereas for uh, radiation therapy it's quite expensive it's a minimum i think think thirty five thousand dollars for getting the instrument for animals but uh the photothermal laser is a pretty compact one it's a small and which, uh, which is uh, like having a pointy um uh, laser with a collimator so it will be pretty cheaper and pretty compatible too Yes, sir. Thank you for answering the questions. And uh, now I'd like to call uh, Dr. Chamundeshwari, Associate Professor, to give the vote of thanks. Good evening to one and all present here. So on behalf of our management and department, I would like to thank Dr. R. Santosh Kailash, Postdoc Researcher, Department of Biomedical Engineering, Tufts University, Medford, USA, on the topic of nanomaterial-based photothermal cancer therapy. So it's uh, really interesting, uh, Dr. Santosh sir. Uh, it's an eminent and a detailed uh, lecture. You have started from the preparation of your nanomaterials, its characterization. Usually we used to hear the things related towards in vitro studies. So in your lecture, we have heard about uh, in vivo study in detail and your conclusions and how you have managed about the immunosuppressions and how the immunotherapy and photothermal therapy can be combined together. It's really too interesting. The current uh, therapy, especially when you cover the nano-based material with that of your photothermal, totally the new and uh, current hot area of research you have shared with us. So this may provoke our UG, PG and PhD students to further check uh, in detail for the research. Thank you very much. Sir. I'm so happy to have your lecture in our department. So uh, I would also like to thank on behalf of the department, our chief patron, Dr. B. Babu Monogaran, chairman, St. Joseph Group of Institution, and patrons, Mrs. S. Jesse Priya, managing director, St. Joseph Group of Institution, Mrs. B. Mr. B. Shashi Shekhar, director, St. Joseph Group of Institution, Dr. V. Shashagiri Rao, principal, St. Joseph College of Engineering, Dr. B. Parvadavadri, Dean Research, St. Joseph College of Engineering, and I would also like to extend my thanks to our department uh, conveners, Dr. G. Shri Kumar, Professor and Head of the Department, and Dr. Renuka V, Professor and HOD, Lab Office. And I would also extend my thanks to our uh, staffs, as well as our student coordinator, Alfred Francis, for helping in smooth sailing of this Vertex series, uh, talk series for the last uh, few months. I would also like to thank all the participants who are listening for the detailed lectures so far. So thank you very much. I hand over the session to Mr. Alfred Francis. Thank you, ma'am. I once again thank all the participants for attending the webinar. And I would like to inform everyone that there will be more Biotalk series in the upcoming weeks. And it will be informed to you very shortly. And hope to see you all soon.
Thank you. Stay safe.